My name is Robin Hart. I've, um, I work here at OICR. I'm the project manager and outreach coordinator for the Reactum project. Uh, you'll hear a little bit more about that uh, during today's talk. Um, I have quite a checkered history. Uh, it's a good checkered history. Uh, I started off as a microbiologist, got into genetics, um, and then went to Japan and uh, did some postdoc in there, and then came back to Canada and got into genomics, proteomics, and then finally bioinformatics. So I've done quite a lot. Um, now, what's not on my CV is how I know Francis Ouellette. Okay, <laughs> I can't be here without this. So both Francis and I started off in the East Labs. So there's one degree of connection there. And this actually demonstrates the, the nature of like the idea that, you know, it, really we are connected with less than six degrees of separation. Uh, awesome power of the yeast. An awesome power of the yeast, exactly. I mean, it's, it's the, it is one of the best model organism of systems. Uh, you can do almost pretty much anything in it. Anyway, the other thing is uh, I know Francis because the lab that he used to work in, there was uh, a graduate student there who ultimately became my supervisor when I be first came to Canada. Uh, and then uh, after that, uh, I ended up working on a project where Francis was a co-PI. And then I obviously started here at OICR and was doing CBW. And Francis again. I still know Francis. <laughs> so I'm trying to think of the next thing. Anyway, so let's get going. Um, so um, we're going to talk about variants and how we link them to networks. Um, I just would like to initially acknowledge that the slides that I'm kind of presenting to here um, are created by myself and by some others, including Veronique Piusan, Gary Bader, Lincoln Stein, and I've also used some of the slides from the EBI training uh, resources as well. So <clears throat> here's the learning objectives of, for today. Um, the goal here really is to understand the principles of network theory and analysis. Uh, we'll talk quite a lot about uh, the, the network data that's out there. Uh, those analytical approaches to network data analysis, um, visualization, and a little bit of data integration. And then finally, we'll give an overview of the Reactum FI network uh, and the Reactum FI Viz Cytoscape application. And we'll actually do this as part of the lab. Yes, Francis. What's FI? Uh, functional interaction. Sorry, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, what is uh, network analysis? Now, I used to talk about pathway analysis a lot. And so, basically, it's the same definition just scrubbed out the word and changed it to network. And it's essentially any type of technique that makes good use of biological molecular network information to gain some insight into a biological system. Uh, I always say it's rapidly evolving, and that is because there's still new techniques being developed, new approaches, new data sets. Particularly in the multi-omics world now, it's really important uh, to um, have new algorithms and new approaches because we're now not just talking about smaller, small data sets, we're talking about much larger data sets, a lot of clinical variants, and how does that information all come together and get displayed in, in a network graph? So there, as I said, there's many approaches here. Uh, and I, fortunately, within an hour, I can only talk about a few of them. Um, so why do we do network analysis? I think, you know, and it's, again, it's same. you can scrub the word out network and say pathway analysis here as well. It's a very intuitive display of information for, for scientists. Uh, you can visualize multiple data types within the network. And there are, certainly when you get to large <coughs> data analyses, uh, computational methods to actually automate that approach. Um, but the important thing about network analysis is it typically satisfies a number of key use cases in biological research. I think by far the most common use case is uh, analyzing a gene list, finding those hidden patterns within your gene list or maybe a protein list. Um, it's also a great way to visualize emergent models that you're developing within the lab um, uh, through, exp through different experimental observations. Uh, they're useful in predicting the function of annotated genes. Um, it's a great framework for establishing quantitative modeling or systems biology. And as we'll learn a little bit later, uh, there's ways in which we can use graphs and networks and, and pathway enrichment analysis to, to potentially uh, uh, identify molecular signatures within your data set. So, uh, as I said, one of the most cited reasons for using a network database or network analysis is to analyze gene lists. So just an example here, um, we have several, um, uh, basically a gene list that was derived from the Cancer Genome Atlas. 
uh, the informaticians there identified 127 genes which they classified as cancer drivers uh, genes based on their mutation frequency. Now, does anybody recognize any genes in that list? Right, nodding your head. That's good. But we don't really know what these 127 genes are doing um, and why these mutations cause cancer. So basically, pathway and network databases allow us to map these genes onto biological pathways and networks to potentially understand their roles within these pathways and networks. So, network analysis in biology. So, um, we typically try to reflect, uh, represent a lot of biologi biology, biological systems uh, as networks uh, because there's a lot of complex binary interactions uh, or relationships between uh, the different types of entities uh, that occur within a cell or potentially within a system. And so um, every biological entity in some ways, whether it's a small molecule, a protein, a gene, an RNA molecule, has some interaction with another biological entity. Um, and that can be from the molecular level all the way up to the kind of ecosystem level. You know, there's a lot of different types of interactions that we can track. And a lot of the biological network analysis that I'll talk about has historically originated from uh, the tools and concepts uh, of social network analysis uh, and the application of graph theory to these social sciences. So, <clears throat> so what is an interaction network? It's essentially a collection of nodes and vertices. Sorry, nodes or vertices and edges that connect these nodes. Uh, as I kind of mentioned a moment ago, nodes can basically represent any type of molecule, protein, gene, small molecule, drug, transcription factor. Uh, it could even reflect a um, uh, an ontology term. Um, and the edges themselves are basically uh, either physical or functional interactions or t some type of relationship between those two nodes. Um, and depending on, so the edges convey a lot of different information about how the nodes link together, um, but also uh, depending on the nature of the underlying edge information, uh, different types of analyses can be formed. So it's important to know the types of nodes and the edges that you have in the network. For this reason, it's useful to highlight the main types of edges that can be found within a network. So um, networks can represent different edges. Uh, there's a directed, I'm sorry, an undirected edges. And this type of edge is found in protein-protein interaction networks. Uh, and it's a simple connection between the two nodes or any node uh, without any additional information. Um, and typically the evidence behind the relationship only tells us that A binds to B. Uh, a directed edge uh, is a connection which is typically found in, say, a metabolic signaling or gene regulation network. And there's a clear flow of, <laughs> excuse me, clear flow of information between the nodes. <clears throat> now both directed and undirected edges can have weight or quantitative value associated with them. Um, so things, this could depict the concept of the reliability of the interaction, the strength of that interaction. It could reflect the quantitative expression change between these two nodes. Uh, for example, one gene, uh, sorry, a, uh, you know, a transcription factor could uh, regulate a gene and there could be a numerical value associated with that. It could also be sequence similarity. Two genes um, could be homologs of one another, um, or orthologs. Um, and these edges can also be weighted by other topological parameters that I'll talk about shortly. Um, so, <clears throat> taking a moment but to go a step back and looking at the different types of biological networks that are out there. Uh, the meaning of the nodes and the edges used within a network representation depends on the type of data being used to build that network. Uh, and this needs to be considered when analyzing uh, your data within the context of the network. Um, different types of data will produce different general network characteristics um, in terms of the connectivity, the complexity, and the structure. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through um, these slides, and in particular, talk, focus on the type of protein-protein interaction networks, which are pre pre predominantly the most that you see in this world. Yes, the question. Uh, sorry to draw a public question. On the previous slide, if you just please go back, there was uh, the network used on the left of the slide. I, there is, for example, connections between node A1 and A2, 
and the W represents the weights between those two nodes? Yes. Then how to just calculate that based on the fact that we have, for example, two genes? Know well, these, as I said, these weights could be, um, they could be, so if you're looking at a gene expression data set, it could be a correlation coefficient that weights that, because you have a connection between the two nodes and you can apply that correlation to the edge. Um, it could be another kind of score that you have using some other algorithm, um, and you're kind of, basically, uh, you could extract, say for example, you could extract uh, a interaction A, B, from a variety of different sources of data. And uh, we talk about this in terms of uh, the functional interaction network as an FI score. Uh, and that's based on the fact that um, uh, anything that has a score of one is basically a, an interaction derived from a pathway database, which we think is a really good, you know, high quality interaction. But as you step down, say for example, you have uh, an interaction between uh, the two proteins that may exist within a model organism system and the experiment is basically a two hybrid, you might not necessarily say that that's the strength of that interaction is as high. So you could use a, a, an algorithm to kind of calculate a weight measurement there based on the type of information that you have available. And so that would score the edge, basically. Um, but again, it could be like, you know, if you're doing sequence similarity, you know, it could be a p value, it could be a whole bunch of other <coughs> numerical values that you can apply to weight the node. Okay? Yes. Do all the nodes have any one, in any one network, they all have to represent the same thing? No. So for instance, if I wanted to represent the two proteins bind together and, and activate a gene, I could just represent it as A1, A2 interact together with an edge, and then both of them bind on a DNA. Uh, you, theoretically, you could do that. Um, I typically don't look at those types of networks because, uh, <clears throat> I mean, you could look at that in a pathway diagram context where you have two components forming a complex. Um, I would also think of that kind of complex. Yes, you, actually you could. In fact, I'm actually contradicting myself now, but yes, when you actually upload, uh, you can download uh, a lot of interaction data from say Reacto in different formats, and the Biopax file is one of these data standards. And when you upload that into Cytoscape, which was, um, it actually does that. So I, I stand corrected, because I typically think of networks as, as you see here, um, you know, the nodes are typically all the same. Right. Even when you're talking about transcription factors regulating genes, yeah. it, theoretically they're different entities, but you may use the same kind of annotation to get that information into the graph. So realistically, you could, the term gene and protein sometimes are interchangeable in the context of getting the information into the graph, but the graph <laughs> itself, the network is actually is showing different theoretically information. Um, Good question, though. Um, so the, the kind of common types of networks that we have is the metabolic network. Um, basically, you've got two nodes, the enzyme and the substrate. Um, so again, this kind of gets back to your question. The enzyme could well be, a pro was obviously going to be a protein. The substrate could be a metabolite, a small molecule, uh, um, so forth. Um, so metabolites and enzymes represent the nodes, and the reactions themselves are represented by the edges. Um, re reactions themselves could be unidirectional or bidirectional. Um, <clears throat> and what's certainly important about this type of network is that the edge itself uh, can also represent the directional flow, uh, or the, sorry, the metabolic flow, uh, or the regulatory effects of a specific reaction. I'm going to get back to your question there as well. Um, a genetic interaction. So a genetic interaction is uh, a derivation, uh, sorry, not derivation, a deviation, sorry, deviation uh, from the expected phenotype when combining multiple uh, genetic mutations, uh, when the individual mutation themselves alone do not exhibit the deviation. So this was, again, back to Francis and I in our yeast days. Uh, budding yeast is classically the, the, the model system that demonstrated these types of genetic interactions. Uh, and you're measuring a single phenotype, in this case, growth rate. Um, so basically, uh, if you have a situation where you have, um, you've knocked out gene A, and there's no effect on growth, and then you've knocked out a second gene, gene B individually, and there's no effect on growth, but the combined deletion of both genes has an effect on growth, that's what we call a synthetic, well, it's actually the synthetic lethal or a genetic interaction. So the genes represent the nodes, and the edges represent the relationships. 
between those nodes. Uh, we have a gene regulatory network. Uh, <clears throat> it's common to represent transcriptional regulatory networks <laughs> with nodes being a merge of genes and transcription factors. Uh, go ahead. So, so then in the previous example, when you showed A connected to B connected to G, so in that case, A and B knocking them both out results in synthetic lethality. So presumably B and D knocking those out will result in also some effect. Does yes. Be the same effect? Um, th I mean, traditionally, it's the same kind of effect, but theoretically, it could be any kind of phenotype. The question is um, important when you're actually merging different data types into networks is making sure that you visually distinguish between that information so that you're not confusing the user as to the source of the data. Um, so you could theorize, you could actually bring in different genetic interactions and present that in the same network. Absolutely. Um, um, the other uh, cell signaling networks. Uh, so basically, this is a communication system that controls cellular activities, the kind of transduction of a signal from potentially outside of the cell all the way down to the nucleus. Uh, it's typically an ordered sequence of events, and clearly, there's a, again, there's a flow of information that's being dictated by these edges uh, within the cell. And again, and again, the entities in this type of network could potentially be proteins, genes, metabolites, drugs, you name it. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, protein protein interaction networks now. And this is probably where I'm going to focus most of my time now. Um, are basically the graph graphical representations of the physical contacts uh, between proteins in the cell. Uh, protein protein interactions are probably are essential to almost every cellular process. Um, so, understanding protein protein interactions is kind of crucial to understanding cell physiology and also um, in the normal cell, but also in certain disease states as well. Um, the, the interactions themselves can represent both transient and stable interactions. So stable interactions are found in protein complexes like the ribosome or hemoglobin. Transient interactions uh, are kind of the brief interactions uh, that modify or they carry a protein <laughs> leading to some additional change. So like a protein kinase, uh, or a nuclear pore uh, importer. Um, and th these transient interactions constitute the most dynamic part of the, uh, the interactome. Uh, the interactome, uh, sorry, and the interactome, I should say, is, uh, is the totality of all protein interactions um, that happen within a cell or within a particular biological context. Um, and the development of kind of large-scale protein-protein interaction screening techniques, things like the two hybrid, and I'll talk a little bit more about them in a moment, has created this kind of large volume of data out there, uh, of interaction data. And uh, there's a variety of molecular interaction databases out there, uh, such as Intact, Mint, and BioGrid, that allow you to download and use this information to help construct your network and perform network analysis. So the fourth step, really, in performing your protein-protein interaction network analysis is to build a network. Um, there's different sources of protein-protein interaction data. Um, essentially, you can obtain this data from, say, for example, your own experimental work. You could be doing, I'm not sure that many people are doing these two hybrid experiments now, but um, that used to be a way of doing these types of uh, identifying mass interactions. Um, um, and you can choose how that data is uh, represented and stored. Uh, the second source, obviously, as I've mentioned, is a primary protein-protein interaction database. Uh, so basically, there's a, typically a team of curators that extract the protein-protein interactions from the experimental evidence reported in the literature. Uh, it's very much a manual process. Um, it typically does uh, provide you with a good source of information, um, but it is important to understand that <clears throat> Uh, there are differences within these databases and the data that they curate. Um, so there's a group called the IMAX Consortium. This is an international collaboration between a variety of different interaction databases. Uh, and their goal is to basically share that curation effort and to work on standards for curation so that there is some unity across the, these different resources in order for users to, to access and download that information. Um, I would say that it's probably often necessary to integrate different types of protein-protein interaction data. 
uh, one source doesn't carry everything that you will need. Um, and <clears throat> they may not necessarily have within their, their data set a full representation of the, the types of interactions that you're looking for. Uh, the other things to consider are to avoid kind of like what we call redundancies and inconsistencies. So multiple databases will have the same type of uh, potentially protein-protein interaction data. Um, and there's kind of inconsistencies in the curation. There can be annotation mistakes. Um, you know, as you know, you can actually find, you know, one paper that says protein C does interact with protein D. And a second paper will say that protein C does not interact with protein D. So the question is, who's right? Well, we're not sure. Uh, and it may be that you need to do other experiments to actually identify that information. So there's some caveats into just simply downloading the data and generating a network. Um, so uh, there is a variety of different IMX partners here. Uh, I'm very familiar with it. Intact, which is based at EBI. Mint is in Italy. Um, there is also a variety of different data exchange formats. Uh, systems Biology Markup Language, SPML, SPGN, Systems Biology Graphical Notation, uh, Protein Standards Initiative, or SI, and then there's Biopax, <coughs> uh, which is basically a bio biological pathways exchange. These are all different kind of ways in which you can essentially download a file of interaction data and upload that data into, uh, into a visualization tool such as Cytoscape. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about these data formats. Uh, they're just a useful way of getting data from out of the database and into your uh, analysis pipeline. So um, it's important to be aware that the interaction data in these databases is derived from different experimental methods, uh, which emphasizes once more the limitations of <coughs> some of this available protein-protein interaction data. Um, so yeast 2 hybrid I mentioned a moment ago uh, is probably one of the most prolific tools that has generated a lot of interactions. Uh, the question, obviously, is how, tr how truly is that interaction in the physiological cell? A interacts with B, sure, in the use two hybrid system, but you, know, you may want to apply other methods that actually try to isolate that interaction within the cell. Um, and um, it's clear that w amongst these uh, methods and also this data within the data in the interactions, databases is that um, there's many kind of what we call false positives and possibly false negatives in there as well so keep that in mind um, our knowledge of the interactome is a little bit incomplete we don't understand all the protein protein interactions that can potentially happen in in a human cell across every tissue under every environmental condition um, we don't have that information and as I said it's noisy as well there's ways to use text mining uh, to pull out um, interaction data. It's faster than hand curation. It's not a perfect science either. Uh, this problem is recognizing gene names. Uh, is hedgehog a gene name or is it a species? But there is ways to deal with that and there's some approaches um, in natural language processing that have been used to actually create effect. Um, and there's popular resources out there that you know, use resources, so use text mining to um, create uh, interaction networks. There's Pathway Studio, Path Text 2, and uh, there's a group called Biota Creative, which are actually a group of researchers that are trying to improve the text mining approaches uh, and, uh, in, in the context of many different biological questions. Um, <clears throat> So let's talk a little bit more about some of the principles of network topology uh, and how that can be applicable to network analysis. Because uh, understanding the complexity of that network is key to extracting useful information uh, that you would not otherwise learn by examining genes on an individual basis. Um, analyzing the, the, the kind of topological features of a network um, is useful in identifying uh, the relevant participants within the network or that your gene list ultimately and looking for kind of what we call substructures in the network that could be useful uh, in trying to ascertain the, the biological significance of the network that you've created. 
um, you can apply these prop these topological properties to the entire network itself as a whole, or to individual uh, nodes and edges or structures within within the network. And there's many different strategies that could be used here. And again, I'm going to try basically scratch the surface here with discussing some. Um, so some of the we're going to introduce to some of the terms uh, small world effect. So protein protein interactions uh, show this uh, small world effect. Basically, this is, basically it's a way of saying that there's great connectivity between proteins. In other words, uh, it could be said that there's a maximum number of steps separating any two nodes in a small. Uh, <coughs> it's basically small, no matter how large that network is. So uh, I'm going to say that most of you are familiar with Facebook. Yes, <laughs> but that clearly is it's a social networking tool. But the principles there basically dictate that, you know, well, it used to be traditionally that, you know, um, any two nodes or any two people uh, were separated by no less than six steps. I think Facebook's demonstrated that that's a lot less now. It's really your, basically my connection to you is, well, there's a direct relationship now because we're sitting in the classroom and I'm teaching you. But uh, before that, there could well have been maybe one or two hops between you and anybody else in this room. Uh, clearly, I've demonstrated I've known Francis for a lot longer, and that's that's uh, started off as a uh, as a, probably a one to two hop down to one hop, and then clearly that's much better. <laughs> We're <a> hub. <laughs> um, and basically, this kind of connectivity is really uh, it allows for kind of what I call efficient and quick flow of information or signal uh, within this network. Um, but you know, it does pose a question: Is that you know, if the if the network is so tightly connected, uh, why don't perturbations or variants or drug interventions, uh, where there's an interact where they're perturbing a single gene or a protein within that network, have a much more dramatic effect or consequences on the network? Uh, biological systems are extremely robust, um, and they kind of cope with a relatively uh, high amount of perturbation. Uh, in a single gene, when you're perturbing a single gene or a single protein. Um, now, in order to understand how this can occur, we have to think about more about another property that's called scale-free networks. So basically, protein-protein um, interaction networks are scale-free. The number of connections each node uh, makes is called the degree. Uh, and the majority of nodes in scale-free networks uh, are basically only have a few connections. To other nodes, and there's so that's what um, which is basically what we call so basically there's a large number of low degree um, nodes, and then there is um, a small number of high degree nodes, and these are nodes where there's more than one there's, there's several connections, okay, and this actually promotes this nature this nature of the the network promotes stability. So basically, when you do get like random failures within the network, the vast, the vast majority of the proteins are actually unaffected in that network uh, in terms of connectivity, and you don't lose that connectiveness. So you don't lose necessarily the functionality of that element of, of those nodes in the, in that in that network. Um, <clears throat> um, and basically, you know, as it scale, it's invariant to changes in scale. So as the ne the network gets bigger. Uh, the network, the nodes and the edges uh, tend to stay quite stable. Um, and uh, I would say that um, when you start to lose more of the major hubs, where you've got lots of these connections, um, you when you start losing more of them, then potentially your network breaks down and you're kind of, you basically end up with this kind of set of isolated little graphs, modules that are not connected. And that's when problems occur. That's probably where we have disease states and things like that. So a question down here at the start, yeah. Um, I see that some of the <coughs> nodes have got like a circle on top of a circle, or you don't seem to have an, an edge effect. Um, so sorry, this, purposes, uh, this is just for graphical purposes, not actually, um, this is just an illustration of a of a scale-free network, uh, I, and I'm actually trying to remember where exactly I took this, this this image from. It's not one of one that I generated. So, typically, you would see um, an edge between uh, the nodes, 
sorry, that's a mistake. Uh, there was another question somewhere. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so another feature to talk about in terms of network topology parameters is distance uh, or shortest path. So this is basically um, the distance between uh, two nodes um, is defined as the number of edges along the shortest connected. Sorry, the shortest um, path connecting them. So if we start in the middle here at zero, uh, the nodes reflecting the, uh, that have the number one are basically one hop away here. Number two, they're two hops away, and so on. So you can basically, when you're doing network analysis, you can have a computer basically analyze all of these different relationships between any given position in the network and any other node. Um, and so this is ways in which we can actually compute and weight networks. Uh, and I'll talk a bit more about some of the algorithms that do this in a moment. Um, another term I want to introduce you to is called centrality. Um, again, this is a term that was developed for social networks analysis. Uh, in the case of protein protein interaction networks, uh, centrality gives an estimation of how important a node uh, or potentially an edge is in the connectivity and the information flow within that network. Okay. Uh, there's different uh, metrics that can be used to calculate centrality. Um, now, it's clear for this, this illustration that the green and the red nodes are important. Uh, does any have any, anybody have any thoughts as to which one's more important than the other? And why? The red one has more connections. That's true, that's right. Uh, how about from the green's perspective? Maybe the green is more important because it's the only thing linking the other ones together, whereas with the red, if you were to get rid of the red, so it does not have access to the green, but the other four. Yeah, the it connected. really depends. So, uh, and the answers are both kind of right. Red and green have their are, have their different levels of importance here. Um, green's got a lot of power because um, the blue nodes obviously interact with the green, and that's the way in which those blue nodes connect to the other side of the graph. And in fact, they connect through green and red as well. And red might be more powerful uh, since red can actually promote the flow uh, of information amongst this kind of close-knit community of gray nodes. So these are, these are this is basically, um, what yes? So one quick question. For example, like the, the, the concepts of the, when you talk about the importance of the nodes, yes. you cannot borrow the same concept like the neural networks, that for example, which each node you assign an input, and then we just uh, have the product of the input with the weighting, the total of that, it shows, for example, the significance of that node. We don't have that concept in uh, network activity like that. Huh? Uh, you say that, for example, either green is more important or the red, yeah. based on the product of all the weights into the input. Yes, that's, that's exactly how that, yes. We have that concept, right? We have that concept, yeah. I mean, that, that exists. And that's, Good question. Um, again, that would require some experimental parameters. There's, there's got to be some data t that supports the node. Like usually, when you're doing an experiment, you're generating some information that you can associate with that node. And if you can associate it with the node, then you could define that on across the edge, and then you could do that from the whole global network. And then you apply an algorithm to basically, essentially try to kind of <clears throat> identify within this network. We'll talk a little bit about this in terms of modulars, but the idea of finding structurally, no, sorry, not structure, I shouldn't use the word structure because you're not really necessarily looking, but you're looking for modules of really where there's a, a high degree of connectivity. And so yes, exactly. It's, um, again, here's another uh, way of looking at centrality measures. Um, so remember, degree is the kind of is the local um, is the local term. So that refers to kind of the dependencies between one node and, it and, and its nearest neighbor. Um, global centralities uh, measure take into account like the the entire network. So something called betweenness centrality. Uh, I have to say I, I always get my betweenness and closeness mixed up, but um, <clears throat> when I try to define this, but but. Um, so between the centrality is where a central node um, provides the shortest path between the nodes. 
uh, and I'll demonstrate that in a moment with this network. The second global centrality measure, which we talk about a lot, is closeness centrality. And this is, is <coughs> excuse me, is measuring the closeness of a central node uh, to other nodes. And basically, this is a, a way of getting an estimation of the flow of information in the network between one node and another node. So, um, basically, in terms of degree, uh, we're talking about the dependencies of other nodes. So this is, oops, lost the cursor there for a second. This connection to here, to here, to here, to here, etc. Closeness um, is basically the closeness of all this to, to our to this node here, whoops, sorry, from this node here to this here is two hops, one, two. That's closeness. And then between this basically is saying that this node in the middle here is connecting the nodes on the left to the nodes on the right. Okay? That's how we do so. Now, um, another important characteristic of protein protein interaction networks is their what we call their modularity. Um, and there's a term called transitivity or clustering coefficient uh, for that for a, for a network. So basically high transitivity means that a network contains these kind of communities or groups of nodes that are densely connected internally. Okay? Uh, and basically looking for these kind of communities um, in the network is a nice strategy for reducing the complexity of the network uh, and extracting functional networks, sorry, functional modules within the network. So things that are like protein complexes, for example, that basically reflect the biology within the network. Um, <clears throat> and there's several terms that are commonly used when talking about these clustering methods, and I'll talk a little bit more about them in a moment. Um, actually, I'll talk about them now. Um, so. Uh, there's motifs. These are subgraphs that repeat themselves in a specific network. Uh, they're typically significantly. They're typically significant. Yeah, start again. They are statistically significant uh, patterns. Uh, mm -hmm. They could form like a negative feedback loop. Um, there is also on the right. There's these network communities or clusters, and these reflect these kind of group of nodes that are connected within themselves than with the rest of the network. Okay, and when we describe protein-protein interaction networks, there's essentially two categories: there's the functional uh, modules, and then these protein complexes. Um, modules are interchangeable functional units uh, in which the nodes um, do have they they don't have to be interacting within the module um, in the same time or space. But the most important characteristic. Uh, of the module is that the intrinsic functional properties do not change when it's placed in a different context. Um, and then in case of a complex, essentially it's a group of proteins that interact with one another at the same time and in the same space. Um, the one thing to remember is that no assumptions are made at the internal structure of these communities. Um, we're only looking at high density, uh, sorry, high, yeah, high density regions. Um, there is a variety of different um, um, uh, algorithms that are used to kind of identify these community modules. Um, it is algorithmically actually it is actually it is algorithmically challenging. It's, it's an extremely uh, kind of complicated process. Forgive me, I'm trying to find the right words here to explain it because it is there's a variety of different algorithms. Uh, they have different approaches uh, and different methods. The goal is basically to identify uh, regions within the network that are where the genes are tightly connected. Um, basically, <clears throat> um, there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, there's Markov clustering algorithm. There's Chinese whispers whispering. Sorry, Chinese whispers whispering. Chinese whispers clustering. Um, a number of them have been kind of developed on the social network uh, and have been reapplied for biological networks. Uh, the one we'll be using today in the Reactive FI network is something called the newman gervin Fast Greedy Algorithm. Um, and there's no simple way of describing it, but it's just like chiseling away at a piece of ice. And you want a beautiful little ice cube at the end of it that's kind of, you know, something that represents, you know, your favorite mountain. 
if you chisel off too much off that piece of ice, it fractures and it breaks and you lose that structure. So the, the skill of the person that is chiseling away that ice with the pig is to just chisel off enough that you get risen. And that's the only way I can describe it because these different approaches are really kind of like, they have really weird equations. I don't want to present you with statistical equations <coughs> or algorithms because you'll, 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 we'll all get lost in them. Uh, the important point is these Sorry. these modules. Yeah. I, I didn't quite understand everything that you said. Um, so the difference between motif and the clusters. What I see here, the motif. These are all these four groups are all connected by that central point. Yes. And you don't have that in the, on the right. That's right. You don't necessarily have a you don't necessarily have a central point within the clusters because with the cluster. Yeah, you're typically, um, with the clusters, you're looking at uh, identifying or more modules. Um, they're basically, there's a, a high degree of connectivity within the module relative to across the modules. That's what you're looking for. And the purpose really of that is, uh, you know, using guilt by association, you know, you, you know genes that are, that are falling to within the same module are potentially involved in the same biological processes. So the next step really is here is the, it's the annotation enrichment analysis. So basically um, there's different ways in which you can understand the context of the protein, the biological context of the protein, protein protein interaction networks. So we use these uh, enrichment analysis tools um, and I should point out it's, it's not strictly a network analysis tool that we're talking about now. We're, this is completely different, but it's um, it's the combination of uh, using the annotation analysis and the topological network analysis is a way in which you can potentially find not just functional modules within the network, but also to label those functional modules with some form of annotation, that be it pathway, could be gene ontology, or it could be uh, some other 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 annotation that you have. I think so you have three quick questions for the clustering that you mentioned. Initially, when you just want to just run, around, let's say, the algorithm, do you have to predetermine how many number of clusters you want? No. Or no. how the system decides on the number of, for example, protein protein interactions? What kind of metrics does the system Well, it use? takes into consideration things like shortest path, distance, um, cent the, the centrality measures that I was talking about. And as I say, it's kind of like getting back to the ice cube. You start off with a large block. You have everything there, and you start chiseling away at whether you're, you know, all the network, different parts of the network, that, and then you kind of get to a point. And forgive me, it's not as straightforward to tell you where where that cutoff point is because for different networks and different data, the algorithm is going to handle the network differently. But it it, it just basically reduces a lot of information down to a minimal. And we'll see this when we do the reactive FI analysis. Is you know, it really will be clear because um, it does give you a list of clusters, and you know that number will, will ultimately change depending on your analysis. Or, for example, the uh, a variety of different filtering approaches. You know, you might uh, only be interested in uh, in nodes within the network that have a particular piece of metadata associated with them. And so when you filter that information, that's going to reduce the size of the network, and that's going to affect the clustering analysis. So there's a variety of different um, things that we can do to basically um, perform, the, to kind of, pre in a sense, preset the system for doing clustering analysis. So we'll talk a bit more about that shortly. Um, in terms of the network visualization and the analysis, you need a piece of software to create the network. And also it's a handy visualization tool as well. Uh, you essentially are uploading your data into that tool, either as a table format or through one of these specialized um, data exchange formats. Um, the network is there to, you know, the tool is there to basically provide you with a way of navigating through the, the, the network. Um, you can analyze the network using some additional applications within the tool. Um, the question here is, do you see clusters or network modules? You can then label those clusters with pathway or genotology annotations, and then you can export that data either as a table or some kind of image that you can pr present in your publication. Uh, and we'll do this when we're in the demonstration when we're working through the React Home, uh, React Home FI Viz app. 
So um, there's different network uh, tools out there. Um, <clears throat> typically, they're standalone applications. Most of them open source. Um, they've initially been kind of developed for kind of social network analysis, but obviously applying to biological data is not a problem here. Um, the difference in these tools is maybe in the way in the support for whether they could support small or larger networks. Um, for example, um, Gelfi is really good. At, um, uh, it can support um, many th networks where there's thousands of nodes and millions of edges. Uh, which may do it, that might represent data slightly better than it, you would see in Cytoscape, but Cytoscape is probably one of the most popular network analysis tools because um, it has, uh, you know, it's got a lot of applications for uh, basically network representation, visualization, integration of other data, and the analysis tools as well. Um, and we're going to demonstrate that later in today's. Uh, uh, in, la in the lab. Um, and then finally there's Navigator, which is another project locally here. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And it's another network analysis tool that again has, it's open source, has a lot of, um, uh, um, can support very large networks uh, many, composed of many nodes and edges. And uh, there's a small suite of analysis visualization applications that, or plugins that will allow you to uh, analyze your data sets. So now let's talk about the Reactor FI network. Um, and we'll learn a little bit more about this um, in, in the lab. But essentially, um, it's a tool that can be used to analyze large gene disease data sets. Um, and the comp purpose of this is analyzing mutated genes in a network context. It allows you to understand the relationships between those genes potentially elucidate the mechanism of action uh, of the drivers and the interactions between you know, the kind of passenger mutations and these, these drivers. It facilitates hypothesis generation and the role of these genes within the, the disease phenotype. And it real, the take home message here is that you're reducing that kind of potentially hundreds of thousands of mutated genes down to a dozen or so mutated pathways. Okay. So the functional interaction uh, is actually based upon um, reliable biological network information from manually curated pathways, uh, which has been extended by verified interactions uh, from a variety of other protein-protein interaction databases. So in order to, um, to incorporate pathway knowledge into the functional interaction network, you have to basically take the reaction itself and basically break it up into a variety of different binary interactions. And that's essentially what we've done. And <clears throat> you um, can then uh, create this large uh, functional interaction network. There's basically two types of information. There's the, the, the interactions based on curated knowledge from pathways, um, and then another uh, which is predicted based on a naive Bayesian classifier. So we're using um, features extracted from human protein-protein interaction databases, protein-protein uh, interaction uh, from projected from several model organisms, uh, gene co-expression data, and protein domain interactions. Um, and basically what you do is you bring all this information together, um, you apply it to the naive Bayesian classifier, and it will classify these kind of, these kind of less reliable interactions, they'll score those less interactions and basically we can combine all of these interactions into a much larger network. Um, and we rebuild this network on a basic, on a yearly basis. So just use this schematic as, a, as an illustration. Imagine that this, that these white lines represents React to FI network. Um, we can inject the genes from your data set into that network. It's corresponding genes and edges in the network that correspond to your, sorry, there's going to be corresponding genes in the network that correspond to your data set. And obviously by, by, by default, we know that there's interactions within those nodes within the network. Now you see there's some sparse connections here. Uh, it's not always like this with the analysis, but um, we sometimes can introduce these little triangles, which we call linkers. These are genes that are not part of your data set, 
there's a minimal amount of fees that we can inject into the network to provide some greater degree of connectivity. So now what you've done is you've gone from a large network, you've projected your genes into that network, and you've come down to a smaller sub-network based wholly on your, your data and potentially some additional genes that provide that connectivity. You subtract away everything else that's not part of your data set, and now you're left with a sub data, uh, you're left with a sub network based on your experimental data. I think somebody had a question here. Yeah. For these linker um, genes, would it be appropriate to go look at the expression of those to see if maybe they were filtered out for some reason? Might well, so here's here's an example of one which could be good. If you've got a gene expression data set that you're using to build a network, those linkers could be the transcription factors. They'll never be expressed. Well, you may not necessarily detect that change in expression. Or or right. Or, or, you know, so, and I, um, I actually, I mean, I've done some data analysis here with this tool, and, and one of the transcription facts, I mean, I actually, um, when I did the analysis, and I, I created this nice functional module, and right in the middle there was actually the transcription factor that was actually direct to the, the expression of all these these nodes, and you could basically colorize whether the genes were up or down regulated in the different tissues. So that's the data. So basically, you've got a, the linker is basically not part of your data because you can't necessarily see it, but it's there in a, in a wholly different way. So I have the questions back there. Yeah, sure. This one here. Oh, this one here. That's right. So this is this is so this large network is and actually I do apologize I just realized now here the network says 291,000 interactions um, our network now is over 400,000 interactions. Yes, the reason that you use for example nine is classifier for that yeah. I should say for that voucher. If you use for example other method of classification, for example non-linear Gaussian classifier or support vector machines, do you get the same networks that you just got it on the next slide or? Uh, the result is going to be different. That's a good question, and I, I'm not sure how. I, I I would wonder if you took a different approach, you would probably get a slightly different network. I think. No, I think that reason, but I mean, why that classifier has been chosen compared to the other classifier? Oh, um, a very good question. I should talk to the developer about that. Um, it's something that he's. I think at the time this was the kind of the standard kind of type of classifier that was applicable to this. This 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 approach, okay. But I, I should I should check with them exactly because I do know that there is other approaches now that you can basically use to, to generate these networks. And is it possible that, for example, different classifiers produces different, I should say, network than you visualize? You see different dimensions. <coughs> I, th I would I would think so. Yeah. Um, so. Um, Anyway, so let's take this uh, 127 genes that I introduced to you at the beginning of the talk uh, from the Cancer Genome Atlas project. So you can basically take this gene list and create something like this based on, I have jumped over a few steps here, um, but these different colored <coughs> modules, you've got, see, you can see there's four modules here. Uh, the genes are more tightly connected here in each of these modules <coughs> than across the network. And we can then, using annotation and enrichment analysis, label the genes within these modules with different, for example, signaling or receptor tyrosine signaling pathways, um, cell cycle, p53 pathway, um, and then signaling by different path, uh, signaling by notch, wint, and TGF beta. Now, having been an immunologist in my past, I know that there are functional relationships between the notch, wint, and TGF beta signaling pathways. So these kind of things kind of do make some sense when you actually uh, take your biological knowledge and actually look at the graphs. But this is a hypothesis generating tool. You need to go and do some additional experimental validation. Or alternatively, you've already done the experiment and you're actually using another experiment where um, you want to use this type of analysis to validate your already uh, your hypothesis. <laughs> Was that based on the, that cluster set in the bottom right? A bunch of those genes are related, are are known to be in the TP53 pathway or in the right. pathway, and so that additional genes that are not known to be in that pathway connecting to it suggests that they are also in somehow interacting with that pathway. Is that the hypothesis? Right. Or, or 
yes, I mean, you could, um, or that there are interactions between these different modules as well um, across the, the the sparse connection. So there's, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm just losing my voice a bit here. I should, I, maybe I shouldn't be drinking coffee. Uh, just bear with me one second. Um, there's different. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> there's different approaches here. You could use it as a hypothesis generating tool or a tool to um, validate an already experimentally derived hypothesis. Um, um, another approach we could take is to combine uh, network analysis um, with gene expression data. Uh, to potentially identify uh, network modules um, that are related to patient uh, survival. So basically here, uh, you calculate um, uh, the gene expression correlations for the genes involved in the functional interaction network, and you assign those correlations uh, to basically convert uh, to the FI, to the, to the edges. So you convert an unweighted network into a weighted one. You then use a clustering algorithm to identify the modules. And then within the Reactome FI app, we have uh, basically two applications, one called Cox Proportional Hazards and Kaplan-Meier model, which allows you to do survival analysis. And then just on the right here, we've got a KM plot. That's Kaplan-Meier plot. Uh, it's drawn for survivability um, versus time el elapsed for the different groups of samples. <clears throat> and basically, there's a log rank test between the two lines to check significance. Uh, so in this case, um, the samples were divided into two groups. Um, samples that have no, uh, sorry, not no, they have low expression genes within the module. That's the red line. And then the samples having high expression in the module, which is the green line. And uh, basically, um, this particular module is, is demonstrated here on the left. Uh, 31 genes within this module were involved in the mitotic cell apparatus. Um, so basically, um, a take-home message from this, this type of a, uh, data integration and analysis is that um, patients with low expression of module genes uh, fared slightly better than patients with high expression of module genes within this particular module. Um, so basically, um, uh, this kind of single network module, or potentially a set of modules, um, could be used as a, a way of defining a signature uh, for patient uh, cancer patient uh, prognosis. So now in the final few minutes of this talk, and I, I'm going to ask if I could have maybe two minutes extra of your time. Uh, it's just a couple of more slides, there's a few more slides, and then the, the slides towards the end are actually just more informational that I don't necessarily need to go through because it's just listing a variety of links to different pathway and network resources out there. So uh, this is just the kind of a more um, <clears throat> topological approach to network and pathway analysis. It's called pathway-based modeling. Um, this Basically, this approach tries to infer how pathway states <coughs> are disrupted in disease. Um, it uses kind of quantitative and qualitative measurements to infer the activities of various components within uh, within the pathway uh, in and relate that to mm -hmm. some kind of disease such as cancer. <clears throat> so um, basically here, you're, the goal here is to try and integrate a variety of different molecular information. Sorry, uh, integrate uh, different types of experimental data um, which could be used to define these kind of multiple molecular uh, alterations. Um, it kind of skews a little bit into the area of systems biology, um, but I hope in the next few slides to explain a little bit more about how these can be useful in a variety of different use cases. So um, basically this is a tool called Cell Analyzer. This is a MATLAB tool uh, that provides uh, algorithms and ways to explore data visually. Um, for the purposes of exploring metabolic signaling networks in the case of this uh, uh, 
computational strain when you're trying to do some kind of metabolic engineering you're trying to alter the you know a strain's ability to to produce a protein or something um, cell net analyzer takes in a variety of different um, metabolic signaling and gene regulatory data brings it all together and tries to predict um, uh, whether a strain is is uh, able to um, um, basically uh, I'm not trying to explain this very well. Apologies, because my brain is thinking about it. But I'm, I'm trying to visually think of this as well. Um, but basically, it tries to um, explore the kind of structural and functional properties of that network. Uh, and we'll leave it there. Uh, NetForest and uh, networking, networking is basically uh, a way of uh, studying the phosphorylation events that occur uh, with uh, a given phenotype or disease. So this is based on looking at large uh, intercellular uh, signaling networks uh, within large phosphoproteomic data sets. Uh, there's Arachne. Uh, this is another novel algorithm. It's been around for a long time. It analyzes microarray data sets. Um, and tries to basically um, to infer uh, interactions based on different uh, gene expression, co-expression data. And finally, this, this paradigm approach I'll spend a little bit more time talking about. Does the, uh, does the arachne, does that incorporate um, non-coding transcripts also? Um, no, not to the, to, no. I think it's, it's mostly gene expression data that it relies upon. Um, <clears throat> Uh, there's also a variety of other algorithms that Cytoscape uses that allow you to study uh, the pathway and the topology of the network. Um, but PGMs, probabilistic graph models, uh, um, the approach here is to, again, integrate multiple different types of data, uh, things like gene expression data with copy number variation or sequence data or protein state information um, to understand how changes within uh, individual entities have an effect on the activity of the pathway. Um, so basically the, the, the questions you can potentially answer here are, are there significantly impacted pathways within a disease? Um, and then the idea here is can you link uh, pathway activities to patient phenotypes as well? Uh, and can you predict, for example, drug effects? Uh, you know, one drug is perturbing uh, a protein within a given pathway, but there could also be other off-target effects. Can you? So, to, for paradigm to work, um, you have basically um, uh, this um, this this network, the simplified uh, network view here for a traditional pathway. But in order for there to be uh, integration of multiple different data types, you have to basically take each individual component of a, a traditional pathway and break it down into what we call a factor graph. And the fact each entity will have information about the gene, the transcript, the protein, and the protein state. And each, with each state, there's an association of a different experimental data type. Um, and so the goal here and we're just going to use uh, this reactant pathway as an example to ask a series of biological questions is um, we have here a, a transcription factor uh, TG, CTGF and NAP, NAPPA, um, which regulate cell proliferation. They're regulated by these different upstream factors, YAP1, WWTR1, and RUNX2. Um, so by converting the reactant pathway into a PGM, um, we can answer questions like, if, if YAP1 copy number is higher, um, is CTGF uh, expression upregulated? Or if NAPA1 activity is higher, um, how likely is it that WTR1 is upregulated? Or maybe something else, maybe RUNX2 is experimentally downregulated. So in this example here, um, we have cop we've integrated uh, copy number variation and uh, gene expression data from a variant samples uh, into this converted factor graph. Um, we perform an inference analysis, and the results are shown with and without copy number variation and gene expression. 
to see how um, much the pathway entities were impacted by uh, abnormal gene expression or by copy number variation and their color proportionally. So the left panel here is basically showing a kind of visualization of the impact of the pathway entities. And then the right panel here is actually showing the kind of observed copy number variation and uh, expression values. So in this slide, um, the comparison is between two ovarian cancer uh, samples. The first sample you can see here has lower NAPA1 expression when compared to sample two here. And it's likely because the copy number um, variation for um, WTR here is higher. Whoops. Um, WTR here is higher here than here. And actually, if we look at, um, sorry, I'm just trying to find it on the left here. Yeah, here we go. So in this sample here, the value for the copy number variation for WTR1 is 1. And here in WTR2, it is actually higher. So this is an approach to, to kind of use the molecular information that you have uh, to integrate it into a model and potentially predict the activity of that pathway um, in, a, in a patient sample. So the last few slides here just summarize all of the different resources that are available uh, for, that I've talked about in terms of um, pathway and network analysis. There's a few additional links here as well and uh, pathway modeling and apparently we're on a coffee break now.